CBC News World. Trusted, connected, to me. Tonight, the prisoner problem. A common front for the cameras and high-level talks behind the scenes. Under stress. A new report says Canada's soldiers need help and they're not getting it. Getting ready. How Salt Lake City will welcome the world. Plus Jennifer Ditchburn on why the government changed its mind about how a huge infrastructure fund will be doled out. You don't think you have a responsibility to blow the whistle? I mean, your ship is going to go down and you're going to be lashed to the mast unless you start talking to us. David Halton on a stormy day at the Enron hearings in Washington. And Harry Forrestell on the possibility that an Enron could happen here in Canada. The National, from the Canadian Broadcasting Centre, here is Allison Smith. Good evening. Peter is on assignment in Salt Lake City. Ottawa wants it clarified. How is the United States deciding that captured Afghan fighters are not prisoners of war, thereby denying them protection under international law? The Khrushchev government is under growing pressure to find out and is taking its concerns to the highest levels in Washington. The CBC's Paul Hunter reports. All right. I'll go to your left. There they stood, shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. Three cabinet ministers trying to answer one question. How can Canada ensure the U.S. is treating the fighters captured in Afghanistan properly? At the moment, uh, we accept the U.S. Uh, statements at their word that they are respecting the Geneva Conventions. We are seeking clarification. It's become a critical clarification ever since word that Canadian soldiers have already handed over fighters captured in Afghanistan to U.S. forces. The Americans call them all unlawful combatants, not soldiers, and specifically not prisoners of war, which would guarantee them all certain legal rights. The question is, who decides? Looking for answers, Canada has been in high-level talks with the U.S. Few details are public, but here's who's talking. Deputy Prime Minister Manley has met with the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Paul Salucci, about this. Defense Minister Art Eggleton has spoken about this with U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Likewise, Foreign Affairs Minister Bill Graham has spoken with his U.S. counterpart, Secretary of State Colin Powell, on it. And Prime Minister Chrétien's foreign policy advisor, Claude Lavadour, has spoken with U.S. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. The Canadian view so far is the Americans are absolutely clear in their opinion that the detainees are not prisoners of war. What's not clear is how the Americans came to that conclusion. They say there is no doubt as to the status that in fact they are disarming and releasing Taliban soldiers. They are only retaining Al-Qaeda. Okay? You now we, 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 no, our, wait. Well, our view is that it's not that simple, that we require some process in order to reach that conclusion. Canada, uh, who is turning prisoners over to the Americans, should insist on clarification right now. Conservative leader Joe Clark says it shouldn't matter that the U.S. says there is no doubt about the detainees. How do the Americans define doubt? Uh, we should know that. Uh, we should know what it is that leads them to say a person is not a prisoner of war but is, but is a terrorist. If we're going to be handing people over to them... Another question is, if all these high-ranking U.S. politicians have already spoken with their Canadian counterparts about it, why are there still no answers? And what's also unclear is that if Canada doesn't like the answer it ultimately gets, what, if anything, can Canada do about it anyway? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada's military ombudsman also had something to say today about Canadian troops in action. André Marin released his much-anticipated report on post-traumatic stress disorder, and it reaches some troubling conclusions, namely that the condition is more widespread than first thought, and that the military isn't doing nearly enough to help those who suffer from it. Rick Bogusky has more. Facing charges of drunk driving, mischief, and assault, former Corporal Christian McEachern walked into a courthouse today claiming he's not responsible for what happened. The charges stem from last March after McEachern rammed his vehicle into the garrison headquarters at CFB Edmonton. 
His defense, mental illness as a result of two peacekeeping missions overseas. It's called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. I have, uh, you know, problems going to sleep because I don't want to go to sleep. Uh, if I've had a, if I'm stressed, you have nightmares if you wake up. From McEachern was diagnosed with PTSD in 1997, a disorder that causes everything from depression to psychotic episodes. He claims his military colleagues offered little support. When he complained to this man, military ombudsman Andre Marat, an investigation was launched into the entire issue. Marat came to this conclusion. The military, sadly, is a fertile ground for prejudice and misunderstanding about PTSD. Marat bases his findings on 200 interviews, half of them with people suffering from PTSD. Retired General Romeo Dallaire is a sufferer tormented by his experiences in Rwanda. I think this report is an excellent, good, swift boot to bring everybody back into the realization that these casualties are still there, they're still going to come. The Ombudsman believes the disorder runs right through the military, that as many as 20% of those coming back from tough missions abroad are suffering from the disorder, and as many as 50% may have partial symptoms. It's hard for people to sometimes understand exactly how it's affecting someone. So there's kind of a culture of, of not wanting to come forward. That, that was the case with Master Corporal Steve Atkins. And when he did come forward, he says there was little understanding. There are medics there that used to work for me that won't give me the time of day, won't look, at, won't look me in the eye, won't even acknowledge that I'm there. I just, I'm sort of an invisible person to a lot of them. That's why the Ombudsman is recommending more tolerance and more resources to deal with the problem. Today, in a written release, the Defence Minister had this to say. We need to effect a cultural change to eliminate the stigma associated with PTSD. Failure to respect and properly treat our members who are suffering from these illnesses will not be tolerated. I'll believe it when I see it. While Atkins isn't optimistic there will be change, McEachern is. The man who started it all with this rampage last March believes others in the military will now be luckier than him. Rick Pogusky, CBC News, Edmonton. The investigation into a ballot cast by this former cabinet minister has been dropped. Maria Minna was accused of voting improperly in a municipal election. The federal ethics councillor Howard Wilson dropped the case after Jean Chrétien dropped Minna from his cabinet. Wilson says he's not responsible for ordinary MPs just members of cabinet and parliamentary secretaries. Ottawa has changed its mind about a pledge it made in the December budget. It planned to set up an independent foundation to decide which projects should receive public money, projects such as highways and sewers. Well, today the government dropped the plan, putting the deputy prime minister in charge of the handouts. Jennifer Ditchburn reports. Already nicknamed the Minister of Everything, today John Manley was given even more responsibility, control of a $2 billion infrastructure fund. I think certainly I'm going to be answerable for in directly in Parliament for how the funds are expended, and uh, uh, I expect that there will be uh, some fairly rigorous uh, review by uh, members of the opposition. Paul Martin's budget had promised the money would be managed by an arm's length body. I am pleased to announce that we are creating a new foundation. But now Manley's growing portfolio will include distributing money to projects like the cleanup of the Halifax Harbour, a new highway in the Montreal area, and the Vancouver Whistler Olympic bid. The government had been getting pressure from its own MPs to let them have more input into the funding. This opposition MP accuses the Liberals of wanting more influence over where money is spent. It looks like the uh, Prime Minister's office uh, uh, found out that finance officials wanted a non-political infrastructure fund and decided to get their grubby hands into the pork barrel. But this former Auditor General says members of Parliament should be able to review how public money is spent. Because the foundations uh, are technically outside of government and therefore escape the direct purview of members of parliament. Actually, we were quite worried about the idea of an arm's length fund because... The president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities says it's much easier for the federal, provincial, and municipal governments to negotiate directly on where the money should go. Well, look, we've been calling for this infrastructure money to flow for ages, and, uh, and, and now it looks like it's actually going to flow. 
Martin says the government is ready to start spending. We are prepared to make commitments as quickly as possible, and in fact we feel it important uh, in terms of the infrastructure program especially uh, to, uh, to really proceed as quickly as we possibly can. The opposition will be watching to see whether liberal ridings get the lion's share of Manly's new infrastructure fund. But for now, the provinces and municipalities are just happy with the prospect of getting that money more quickly. Jennifer Ditchburn, CBC News, Ottawa. And speaking of money, the federal government will be paying off some of the national debt this year after all. That's not what the government said in its December budget. But the economy has been doing a little better than predicted, and Ottawa is saving enough money on interest payments to pay for programs such as the one Jennifer just mentioned. The debt payment is expected to be at least one and a half billion dollars. A workers' compensation panel has broken new ground. It's ruled a Nova Scotia man's sleep disorder was caused by shift work. Richard Ross was employed at a Michelin tire plant in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. He says rotating shifts left him with debilitating insomnia. The panel ruled that amounted to personal injury and awarded compensation. It's been a long uh, three years uh, going through the various levels of appeals, um, but the outcome has been positive, and I'm hoping that uh, possibly the company may uh, bring me back to work. Michelin has 30 days to appeal the decision. Parts of Atlantic Canada are digging out from a blast of winter. Halifax was hit with up to 30 centimeters of snow and strong winds. And in St. John's, schools and the airport were closed for the third time this winter. The Montreal Expos will play another day and at least another season. Baseball Commissioner Bud Selleck has postponed the idea of contraction until 2003. Owners voted in November to eliminate two teams. The Expos were expected to be one of them. Politicians of all stripes are working overtime this week in Washington, trying to get to the bottom of the Enron scandal. The former energy giant flamed out last month, sparking a giant investigation in Congress. And today, it ordered the company's former chairman to make an appearance next week. The CBC's David Halton has the latest. Fine, nice to see you. The decision to subpoena Ken Lay was unanimous. Members of Congress increasingly convinced the Lay and other Enron executives are guilty of a huge corporate crime. Chewbacca, Jedi Capital, Kenobi Holdings. The names of some of the many partnerships that Enron set up to enrich its bosses and to hide millions of dollars of debt. Is Ken Lay the Luke Skywalker of this tale, or is he the Darth Vader? Well, he's not the Luke Skywalker. <laughs> um, He certainly is responsible. That answer from William Powers, the man commissioned by Enron's board of directors to investigate the company's collapse. Powers' report was damning. There is no question that virtually everyone knew, everyone from the board of directors on down, everyone understood that the company was seeking to offset its investment losses with its own stock. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record... Another committee heard former Enron employee Deborah Parada describe how Enron's bankruptcy wiped out $40,000 of her retirement savings. Herein lies many lessons for the American workers, and I'm sorry, I'm an example. Parada said she could no longer even pay for her daughter's wedding. As a mother, this is something I always dreamt of doing for my daughter. Today, that burden has fallen on her shoulders. You're now under oath. Thank you very much. Yet another committee grilled Paul Berardino, CEO of the Arthur Anderson accounting firm that signed off on many of Enron's bogus deals. Did your company see these things and go to the board with them or go to the shareholders meetings or do something? But Berardino said he wasn't aware of what was happening to Enron. I don't know with authority what we knew and when we knew it. I mean, how do you let this happen, Captain? I mean, your ship is going to go down and you're going to be lashed to the mast unless you start talking to us about what happened. Some Democratic congressmen are trying hard to drag President George W. Bush into the Enron scandal. They want a special prosecutor appointed to investigate whether Enron won any favors in exchange for the more than $600,000 it contributed to Bush election campaigns. 
Bush says this is purely a business problem, one that's being fully investigated by the Department of Justice. David Halton, CBC News, Washington. As David's report mentioned, a big part of the Enron scandal has to do with accounting practices. It appears they were questionable at best. And that has market watchers in this country wondering about our accounting rules and whether they're tough enough. Our business reporter, Harry Forrestell, has that story. They're calling it Enronitis, a slide in the markets over the past few days prompted by fears of a contagion of faulty accounting infecting not only U.S. companies, but Canadian firms as well. Canada is far more likely to have multiple Enrons than the U.S. Forensic accountant Al Rosen ferrets out faulty bookkeeping, and he says Canada's accounting standards are weaker than the U.S. There are many reasons for it, like it's our court decisions, uh, no National Securities Commission, poor class action laws, the training of auditors. They don't look for fraud to start with and we can just go down the list. And another concern, accounting firms like Arthur Anderson that accept consulting fees from the very companies whose financial health they're auditing. And if you have a company that is skating close to the wire in the first place, don't forget that your auditors are negotiating their fees immediately with the chief financial officer whose work they're going to go in and verify. It's a risky game. Canadian businesses know that creative accounting can easily backfire. If you don't maintain that confidence in the, in the financial statements, eventually you cannot go back to the investors to raise additional capital. The man representing Canada's chartered accountants says his profession is doing its best to raise standards. I think our standards in this country are as good, uh, if not better, I guess, than, than other standards, and we revise them constantly. Canada has its own troubled history of companies whose accounting practices have raised serious concerns. Names like Bramley, Confederation Life, and Castor Holdings. And who could forget Livent, Garth Drabinsky's entertainment colossus, accused by the Ontario Securities Commission of cooking the books. But according to Rosen, the cases that are heard about are just the tip of the iceberg. In terms of the amount or the number that get to court, you're seeing maybe 15, 20 percent at the most. I'm confident there, there'll be changes required on every front out of what we learn from the U.S. Failure to learn those lessons would be expensive. Foreign investors aren't interested in putting their money into a country whose accounting practices are under suspicion. Harry Forrestell, CBC News, Toronto. <laughs> was formally indicted today on charges of conspiring to kill Americans abroad. He was also indicted on four new charges, including contributing to the Al-Qaeda network. Walker's lawyers say there's no evidence he fought against U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan, and they want him released while he awaits trial. A court will hear arguments on that tomorrow. And in Kabul, Afghanistan's national flag was raised at the presidential palace in a lavish ceremony unheard of under the Taliban. Interim leader Hamid Karzai said the flag symbolized a new era for the country. And Mexico's so-called volcano of fire is doing more than it's named for. It has started spewing rocks and lava, signs it could soon explode. Today, soldiers evacuated the village at the foot of the mountain. More than 200 people were moved to shelters in other towns. More than 150 Canadians are about to make a dream come true, the dream of going to the Olympics. Most of Team Canada headed to Salt Lake City tonight. The CBC's Marnie Kagan caught up with some of the athletes before they left. Pascal Richard had the feeling he'd forgotten something. He was packing for his first Winter Olympics where he'll compete in the ice sliding sport of skeletons. Today, his head was spinning. I was starting to think in that I'm going to Olympics. I wasn't sure before, you know, like I, I knew I was going, but now I'm going, you know, like this is the day. In Calgary, where most of Canada's Olympic athletes train, you could feel the excitement growing. Fans appeared at last minute practices 
to snatch autographs that could one day be worth gold. The anticipation even affected sports veterans like Curling's Kevin Martin. The Edmonton skip has won briars and championships before. This, he says, is different. Actually, this morning, uh, yeah, I found myself uh, uncharacteristically kind of, I don't know, nervous or butterflies or excited or call it what you like, but uh, it's a good feeling. It's really hard to believe that four years have gone by since Nagano, and um, we're really excited. Excited, but focused. Canada's women's hockey team took its final skate today. Players say it's a much stronger team than the one at the 98 Olympics in Nagano. But it still has to face its arch rival, the U.S. team. We're going there and we know that, uh, I mean, that's the best team in the world. And we go there and want to uh, focus on what we are capable of doing. Tonight, though, it was all Canada. A special send-off at the same plaza built for the 88 Winter Olympics in Calgary. A chance for fans to show their pride and wish athletes well. Go Luz, team go! Go Eric, go Grant, go Chris, go Mike! Bring lots of that gold back. <laughs> we never do that great in the Summer Olympics, but winters they're ours. <laughs> With that kind of support and patriotism behind them, these athletes are headed south to try to make their golden dreams come true. Marnie Kagan, CBC News, Calgary. And in Salt Lake City tonight, all systems are go. The organizers of these Olympic Games appear to be, well, very organized. And by all accounts, the city will be ready for the games to begin. CBC's Ian Hanamansing looks at the final flurry of preparations. So little time, so much to do. Three days before the opening ceremony, workers seem to outnumber athletes and visitors on the streets of Salt Lake City. This crew has installed 1,700 signs in the past week. They've got more than 300 to go. Are you going to make it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're working almost nine days. In some areas, the streets have become a maze of detours, delays, and closures. Frustrating to be sure for motorists, costly for some businesses. Was it supposed to be this way? No. Howard Ujifuza has run this downtown camera shop for 51 years. He says the last three weeks have been the slowest ever. Look at the fence out there, and look at all the guards. Who can get here? There is little of that exasperation in here. Olympic officials say there is no doubt all of the athletic venues will be ready. Curling, in fact, is ahead of schedule. Carefully monitoring the ice and air temperatures is the deputy chief ice maker, a Canadian, by the way, who says the curlers should be quite pleased with this surface. As long as we've done uh, our best, and we know we've done our best, and uh, we've provided uh, the Class A uh, world-class conditions, uh, then I'm going to sleep well uh, when I go home. And are you going to sleep well? Oh, yes, definitely. And each day more athletes arrive. 77 countries will be represented, many from places you might not associate with winter sports. From the birthplace of the ancient Olympics, Greece, uh, everybody thinks that in Greece it's only the islands and uh, hot in summer, but in the winter we have a lot of snow and uh, it's near to 20 ski resorts for skiing, for training. And from sun-drenched Trinidad and Tobago, following the trail blazed by the Jamaicans, the bobsleigh team. It's tough to do any kind of training in, in, in the islands. <laughs> I actually spent a lot of time in Calgary. I uh, adopted my home track, per se, out of Calgary, because that's where I learned to go to driving school. And a few of the Canadian athletes have already arrived, including skier Eddie Potavinsky. Doing a few challenges will be my fourth time, and uh, but you know what, it's, it's just like, it might as well be my first time. It's so exciting, you know, just being at the Olympics. As for spectators, 88% of the Olympic tickets have been sold. Officials say they still have seats available for cross-country skiing, curling, and some early hockey games. You could, of course, always go to a scalper. I spoke to one this afternoon who had just sold one ticket to the gold medal finals in men's ice hockey for $1,700 U.S. Ian Hanamansing, CBC News, Salt Lake City. the National for this Tuesday. I'm Allison Smith. Good night.
Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by the Globe and Mail, where perspective is everything. To subscribe, call 1-866-36-GLOBE.